All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up here today. Uh, my name is Quinn Snyder. I'm a uh, technical advocate with Cisco Learning and Certifications. Uh, but before that, I was a developer advocate with Cisco DevNet, covering uh, infrastructure as code, DC networking, NSO, and a variety of different technologies. So. Um, I enjoy doing this presentation. I love seeing the wows on people's faces um, because Terraform is kind of the new big thing, uh, but a lot of people don't know where to get started or they're kind of intimidated because Terraform uh, doesn't seem like it's as easy as Ansible. And I'm here to dispel a lot of those myths and show you the power of, of what Terraform can really do in an introductory way. Um, so before I get started, how many folks here have actually used Terraform in uh, either a lab or production setting? You don't count, Daniel. Uh, okay, perfect. So there's a lot of newbies here. That's great because this is a very introductory course, this is a, or not a course, but a, a, a demonstration, as I said. Um, if you join the uh, WebEx space, you guys have all seen this slide, uh, hopefully uh, quite a few times by now, but if you find this uh, lightning talk, I think it's DevLit2785, uh, scroll down to the bottom, join the discussion, you'll be dropped in a WebEx space with me, I will be dropping a PDF of the slides, because I don't think they were posted, as well as the links to my sample code that I'll be using through this demonstration, and how you can access the sandbox that, will be, um, that you can use to test this out yourself. So um, this is going to be a really quick set of, of slides. I really want to get to the meat of the discussion, which is the hands-on to show you the power. Um, but I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't give you a little bit of background information about Terraform, what it is, what it does, and why it's so cool. Uh, so we'll work on those things. We'll talk about HCL syntax, and then we'll do a demo and some wrap-up. So Terraform um, was developed by HashiCorp in 2014, and it was really started off as, a, as an infrastructure as code tool for the big cloud providers. If you've ever logged into a cloud provider's console, AWS, Azure, GCP, there's a lot of click ops that go on in there. So how can we automate that provisioning? Hashi was really like, that was their big play initially when they released it. But since, uh, since then, people have discovered the power of immutable infrastructure, uh, fully declarative end state modeling of your, of your infra, and so a lot of on-prem uh, providers and, and OEMs have made um, providers, which is kind of the, the plug-in or the, or the collection, to support on-prem infrastructure with Terraform as well. It's written completely in Go, which creates a single binary file. So that's good and bad. Uh, unlike things like Ansible, where we have to have pip install and make sure we have the right versioning and things like that, and there's an upgrade process and, and making sure you're in the right virtual environment and things like that, Terraform is just a single binary. I can curl it from terraform.io, put it in my path or in my local folder, and I'm off to the races. There's also no upgrades. I don't need to worry about you know, starting up and doing a, an, an update or anything like that. I would just download the new binary and install it back to path. Uh, for those who are familiar with more Pythonic uh, tools, so PyEnv, um, there is a Terraform equivalent for that called TFEnv, uh, which allows you to, to kind of manage multiple versions of Terraform and do some really cool things with project files and things like that. Um, but that's a little out, outside the scope here. But just know it's a single binary file written in Go. The other important part about things being written in Go, there is no native SSH library for Go. So unlike with Python where we have Paramico and NetMico where we can use SSH into devices, Go has no equivalent. Carl Montanari, who I believe works at Twitch still, has created Scraply Go, uh, which is a way that you can interact with devices using Golang and SSH. However, that has not and probably will not ever be ported into Terraform. Terraform is for REST APIs only. So that may discount it from an automation perspective if you're thinking I'm going to go configure 1,000 iOS XE devices or 1,000 NXOS devices. You just can't do that with SSH with Go. So uh, that caveat is out there. But it is a fully declarative, fully end state declarative uh, configuration language model. And what I mean by end state declarative, unlike other uh, IAC tools where I have to provide step-by-step -step instructions on how to get from point A to point B, Terraform doesn't care. With Terraform, I write what I want the end state of my infrastructure to look like, I apply that configuration, and Terraform, through its providers, does all of that messy backend uh, configuration and figuring out what needs to go where and how and when and what order for me automatically. So I write what I want in whatever order I want, if it comes to me or if there's a specific process, uh, I run a Terraform plan, Terraform apply, 
that configuration is applied to my devices automatically. I don't need to think about it. Um, and that's what I mean by end state declarative. The one thing I will say, though, is Ansible is also declarative, but I call it declarative at the task level because I'm not having to write pure syntax, um, but it is, I have to worry about the order in which my tasks are created, so it's at the task level that it's declarative. Um, typical Terraform workflow. I'm going to kind of work through this really quick. Um, first, like I said, you download the, the binary, install it to your path. Uh, you write the, uh, the configuration in HCL, uh, and I'll touch on some of the syntax and how, what it looks like and some of the control mechanisms and things that are available in HCL in a little bit. Uh, you then perform a Terraform init. So by default, when I download Terraform, I just have the binary file, that Terraform binary. It doesn't know how to connect to any of my infrastructure. I have to do an initialization, which reads the top part of my configuration file and says, what providers do I need to download? It'll reach out to the uh, Terraform registry, grab the appropriate providers, and install them in my local project folder. Without those providers, Terraform does nothing. But the init downloads those providers and gets them installed. The next step is a Terraform plan. It's not a required step. It is a best practice step. But Terraform plan says, I'm going to read in all that configuration. I'm going to look at your infrastructure and then see what do I need to change and apply. Maybe I delete some things. So you're starting to get that two-stage uh, commit process going on there. The nice thing about Terraform with the plan stage is that if you have it snapped into a VCS and part of a CI-CD pipeline, you can take that Terraform plan output and have that be printed as part of your merge process. So as part of your PR, you can act, extract that data and have that as a record in your pull request in your VCS system to make sure, hey, here's what we're going to change before we do the apply, and you have a single source of truth inside of your, your uh, VCS. The last step is a Terraform apply, which does just what it says. It takes the configuration and applies it towards my end device. The other advantage that you get with Terraform is this destroy action. So again, unlike other IAC tools where I would need to create the forward and the reverse action if I wanted to delete some, some configuration, Terraform is stateful. Terraform says I track the state of what was, my configuration that was applied, and what exists now. So I get that delete action for free because it's tracking what changes it has made. That's good and bad. Because it's tracking those changes, like I said, I get that delete action for free, batteries included. The problem is, if I change that infrastructure outside of Terraform, you can have a really bad time because what Terraform thinks is the state may not actually be the state, and you have to rectify those two before you can delete it. So be very careful when you're modifying things created with Terraform. And there was a, session, a workshop earlier over in the DevNet zone uh, by my uh, friend Francois who used the term immutable infrastructure. And if you talk to anybody at Hashi, Terraform creates immutable infrastructure. You create it, you don't change it. If you want to change it, it deletes and recreates something new. It does not drift. It doesn't do that gooey middle stuff like Ansible does where you kind of move from point A to point B. Terraform removes A, creates B. So be aware of that. HCL looks intimidating. It's really not. There's two main um, uh, kind of control structures here. There is uh, an argument, which is highlighted in yellow. Those are just simple assignments. Something equals something else. And then blocks. The blocks can get a little hairy because of how they're created. Without getting into a whole lot of weeds, Terraform has two main, well, several different types. But when we're talking about interacting with infrastructure, we have resources and data sources. So in this case, I have a resource block that is going to create an ACI tenant, and I've called it Terraform tenant. I could have called it whatever I want. I then create a curly brace, and all of the arguments that sit inside of that curly brace are assigned to that block. So it's without having to do all that ta performative tabbing like I would with YAML, I just have a curly brace, put whatever I want, and curly brace it back. And I know that that all goes together. So I'm not having to do like rainbow uh, highlight or, or rainbow indent or whatever the VS code is. I'm not having to use cursor column like I do in Vim. I just have curly braces, track the curly braces, and we're good to go. Um, you can read in configuration. So I, I showed the resource um, interaction earlier. You can also use a data source, which allows me to look at the configuration that exists on a device, read it in, and then store it to do some other action with that data later. So think of um, data sources as a get, 
and resources as a put, if we want to equate that to HTTP verbs. Um, the other thing that gets really complex with, with Terraform is that dotted notation. So again, let's go on another journey here. In this case, I'm talking about an MSO uh, plan for, for the multi-site orchestrator or, or Nexus dashboard orchestrator now. You can see this, this top resource in green where I have uh, a resource MSO schema. So I'm creating a schema inside of MSO, and I've called it schema object. And in that object block, I have a template name uh, reference. So I have a key value of template, um, template name equals template one. If I want to reference that later on, in order to, to find that specific value, I just use like a dotted notation like I would with Python if I'm nesting through classes. So down here at this bottom part, I have MSO schema. So what, uh, what resource am I talking about? Uh, schema object, so that's that locally significant name, and then template name. So I'm just nesting through those with a dot notation instead of having to do other weird circular references. The last thing that I'll cover on this is sometimes you'll have things that get exposed as part of the run that aren't really inter user interactable. A lot of those are, are going to have a dot ID reference, which is like a unique UUID for that specific instance of that run, so you can reference that later without having to do a lot of, of weird uh, n nesting and naming and things like that. So you can have things exposed as part of the run without actually declaring them. And then finally, it is possible to do programmatic things, like control loops and things like that, um, with Terraform just as I would with Ansible. So on the right-hand side, excuse me, I have a, a variables file. And I, in that variables file, I have a variable called switches. So the type is variable instead of data source or resource. And I've called it switches. Inside of that variables file, I have a long map and that creates a list. So I have this map denoted in curly braces, and then I have a set of devices, spine one, spine two, leaf one, two, three, and four, and each of those uh, uh, list members has another map inside of it, or another block inside of it, with uh, an IP address and a role. If I want to loop through that entire list of objects and fill them in and add them, in this case it's to an inventory file for NDFC, I just do for each, which is my control mechanism, for each item in this list, uh, and that list is variable switches, so find the uh, switches variable and loop through those items. And then fill in each value of the IP key, so key value pairs. So fill in the value of the IP address in each of those items and then for the role, similar things. We've touched on this, um, declarative versus procedural. And then finally, why would we want to lose to, uh, use Terraform? Just because it, and, 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 and more, more importantly, um, where's my code? Just because we're not writing in Python or Node or Go does not mean we don't have code. When we abstract some of that complexity away, like we would with Ansible or Terraform, we create a very universal uh, set of, of con configuration that we can then snap very quickly into a VCS for, for repository and checking. It becomes much more universal. We don't have to worry about those control loops and all that, that, that thinking of how to interact with these things. Plus, we've documented our intent. Because we're just talking about the data structures, like the tenant names or the, the IP addresses and, and, and um, roles of those switches, we've abstracted all of the, the noise. We're focusing on the data, what is really going on inside of our network or what we want our configuration to be. So we have our intent, and when you snap that into a VCS uh, system, like um, you know, whether we're using GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, et cetera, when you are archiving your IAC inside of a VCS, you build a pipeline, you have a, I mean, a CI CD right there. So by just archiving it there and having it in, in IAC, you're most of the way there. You just got to build a pipeline or use some tooling like Atlantis to, to do that for you. So with that, any questions? Sweet. Once I get my video back, we'll slide over and we'll do some demo. So this is nothing fancy. This is just a reservable ACI sandbox uh, inside of the DevNet sandbox ecosystem. And let's see, I've got 15 minutes, so we'll cruise through some of these. I won't get to all. But uh, on this other side, I just have a VS Code window that is opened to a few um, TF files that I've got created. I will share the sample code with you. Um, at the end of this session by joining that, that WebEx room. So let's look at a very simple uh, plan. So in this plan, at the very top, I've declared my providers. 
I'm going to be using the ACI provider. No knowledge of ACI is required for this, by the way. This is very high level, but ACI demos really nicely because I can, it, A, there's a provider for it, and B, when I make a change, it's instantly reflected in the UI. So I, I've, I've called, I've pulled down my provider, and I've called it ACI, and I've used the source, which is the Cisco DevNet ACI, which is where that provider's hosted. I don't have it locked to a version. Best practice says you probably should, um, but because I'm just doing tenants, I don't care about locking it to a version specifically, so it'll just pull the latest version by doing that pull. The second piece here is talking to the provider. So with that ACI provider, how am I going to connect to my infrastructure? In this case, admin Cisco 12345, there's the URL. Insecure equals true because I don't want to do uh, certificate validation because it's a lab. Um, obviously in production, you're probably going to want to do that. And then the bottom part of this is the meat of, of, the, of the plan. Resource ACI tenant, so resource is sending configuration. I'm creating an ACI tenant, I've just called it Terraform tenant. I've given that tenant a name, QMS tenant 01, and I've given it a description. That's it. So, first step here, I'm in, let's go to the intro folder. I'm going to do a Terraform init. That's going to download the, excuse me, the provider. And you can see it's all green, so green is good. It's been initialized. The, the other nice part about the Terraform download process is that it is signed. Every provider, before we can uh, send them up to GitHub and uh, place them in the registry, has to be signed with a key. It's going to download that provider, verify that the key is actually what it says it is in the registry to make sure there's no man in the middle attacks. So you are guaranteed to have a good um, uh, and non hijacked tenant, uh, sorry, provider. So all that's done. I'm going to do a Terraform, Terraf Terraform. You'd think after typing this 10,000 times already, I should know what to do. This Terraform plan is going to give you this output. What it's saying is, I've read your configuration file, I know what exists on the infrastructure, I'm going to create these things net new, denoted by the green plus. In this case, it's pulled the tenant name, it's pulled the description, and then there's some other things that could be configured if I chose to, um, but I don't have to. If it says, known after apply, that generally means I'm just going to accept the defaults of whatever that device is. So. Um, the tenant's not very interesting, but if we talk about VRFs or bridge domains instead of ACI, there's different things that can be set that we'll just accept the defaults for. Now I'll do a Terraform apply. Now, because I have skipped a few steps with the plan process, it's going to ask me when I do the apply, do you really want to do this? Just a little bit of a check. I understand the risks, I'm going to hit yes. It's going to create that tenant and then it's going to appear over here inside of my tenant window in the fabric. Now the nice thing is, is the newer versions of ACI support the orchestrator tag. So by default, when I apply a configuration with Terraform, it will append this orchestrator Terraform tag to that tenant, which indicates that I've created this with Terraform, use caution if you're going to be manipulating with the GUI because of that state tracking. In fact, if I click into this tenant, it should say, it's been created with an orchestrator. You might not want to do anything or you might have a bad time. So it gives you those warnings there, which is nice and handy. So uh, let's go to all tenants here just so we can back out. The next thing I'm going to do is go into a slightly more complex example. And this uses a variables folder or file. I should say. So let's go main.tf and store that, and variables.tf and store that, and close the window. So the main.tf is going to look very similar to what I had before. I've declared my provider. My provider will connect to the ACI fabric. The difference here is now I've called a variable. I've pulled away that hard-coded information and moved it into a variables file. So anytime you see a var dot prefix, Terraform is going to look for something declared as a variable. Uh, and then similarly, in the resource, I've done the same, var dot tenant. It's going to look for a variable called tenant in some other Terraform file. Now, I've called this variables.tf, but I could name it anything. The important part with Terraform is it treats every folder 
as a project. So when I do a Terraform plan, it will read in all of the HCL files in that folder and mash them up automatically looking for things. So I could have given three Terraform files. I could have given it a user.tf um, and an aci.tf. And it would have taken those three configurations with the main.tf and mashed them all together and said, here's what we're going to create. But I've just called it variables to keep track of it uh, and make it a little less confusing. Now, the important part here is in this variables.tf, I have a type variable. So it's looking for the, it's declared as a variable. And I've called that variable user. Those align directly with this var.user piece that I use to connect to the, uh, the, the fabric. Then in each of those, I have this map where I have username, password, and URL. So those align directly to username, password, and URL. So the linkage is, is easy to see once you, once you generate it all together, um, but it can be a little intimidating because it's like, what do these things reference and where are they being found? Same thing with the tenant. This is only an assignment, um, an, uh, an argument block, because I don't need a map. There's only one piece of information I want to, to create. So I just have a default value of QMS tenant 02 for uh, my tenant name. So when I perform the Terraform init, you'll get really good at typing that, by the way. And then Terraform uh, plan. It's going to see that I have, it's going to take those two files, that main.tf and that vars.tf or variables.tf, and it's going to mash them up together. I didn't tell Terraform what files to look at. It just does it automatically. So it's taken the, the information for the tenant02, placed it in the main.tf, and now if I do a Terraform apply, and I'm going to skip a step, you can do auto approve. Um, the one thing that really bothers me about Terraform is it doesn't follow POSIX standards, so your switches are just one dash and not two. So keep that in mind. Uh, Auto-approve doesn't give me the prompt to say, are you sure you really want to do this? It's created those two things. We've added one resource, and we saw that tenant appear over here in the fabric. So great, I've created two tenants. Really easy. The last thing I want to touch on in the, in the last few minutes that I have here is really about the idea of that end state declarative nature of Terraform. So again, without having to know a whole lot about, um, uh, about ACI, I'm going to take a little bit more complex example here. And this deals with some network level constructs of ACI. Still very high level, still very simple. But in this main.tf, again, I have my declared provider. I have how I connect to the ACI fabric. I've created my tenant, but here down below, I'm creating three new items, a VRF, a bridge domain, and a subnet. Now, if I was writing this in Ansible, this is the exact order that I would need to put it in because the tenant is the top level structure. The tenant has a VRF, a bridge domain is assigned to a VRF, and a subnet's assigned to a bridge domain. So you can see that logical progression down the stack. In fact, you can even see the relations here because in that subnet, I have that parent DN, which is who's my, who's my, uh, what's the uh, distinguished name of my bridge domain? And I've referenced it here with that ID value. The bridge domain says I'm assigned to what VRF and what tenant, and then my VRF is, says what tenant I'm assigned to. So you can see that relationship there. Now, when I go through and do a Terraform, let me scroll this up. When I do a Terraform init, and then do a Terraform plan. Nothing should be surprising. It is going to create all of these different items and objects. So uh, like I said about having that known after apply, so especially with like a VRF, um, you know, we have the known, um, you know, we can do all different kinds of, of, of items here. Same with the bridge domain, uh, same with the uh, subnets here. Do we allow flooding or what are we doing with the, the bum traffic, things like that. You can, all those are values that can be changed. It's just, I haven't added them in the map, so it's just going to accept the defaults. Let's do a Terraform apply, auto approve. And we will have a tenant that gets created. It's going to take a little bit longer because we are creating more uh, objects underneath it. But just to show you that uh, in Rocky and Bowinkle style, there's nothing up my sleeve. Uh, I'll show that the networking does actually exist. We do have a bridge domain with a subnet that's in there. 
and a VRF exists as well. So we've created some network level constructs in the fabric. You say, cool, that doesn't show me anything I couldn't do with Ansible. Well, here's where it gets really interesting and a little fun. I'm going to go to another folder that's an unordered network. And scroll down. Main.tf and my variables.tf. So in this main.tf, I have the same content. I'm still doing the same things. I'm creating a bridge domain, a subnet, a VRF, and a tenant. But I've put them all out of order. Put the bridge domain first, followed by the subnet. So you say, okay, that may work. But now I have a VRF, and then that bridge domain is related to the VRF, but the VRF's not to the third step, and then the tenth's the last step of all. None of this should work in Ansible, and it won't. But with Terraform, because I said it's end state declarative, I don't need to worry about the order that I've put these items. It figures it out at runtime and then applies the configuration in that correct order. So I will start with the Terraform init and then a Terraform plan. You can see, okay, we've got all those plus signs. Maybe, maybe it's really not reaching out. Maybe it's just it's saying here's the things that we need to create. Um, but it's not actually going to do it when we do an apply uh, action. But all the things look the same. Okay. We'll do a Terraform apply auto approve. And if you watch how Terraform's creating this, it's applying it in the same order that it did with the ordered one. Tenant, VRF, bridge domain, subnet. And those four things have been added. You can see the tenant has been created. And in fact, the networking, so the VRF is there, the bridge domain's there, and the subnet is there, just as I configured inside of my Terraform file. It's not sorcery. Every Terraform file has what's called a Terraform graph that gets built. And so I have this command here, Terraform graph, and you can query what the graph output is going to be with Terraform with every single plan. So Terraform graph gives you how Terraform is computed, what uh, constructs need to be created in what order, and then this other stuff is just kind of fancy conversion. It creates a dot file, a, a topology dot file first. Because of the viewers and everything, you have to pipe it out, and I've, I've recreated a ping file, so you can actually see what, what happens with it. But if I do, let's see here, cat graph command pipe to bash, we'll see that we get this terraform graph.png that's created. And again, without actually having to know the ACI MIT, you can see that looks really familiar to what we needed. We have the tenant, the VRF, the bridge domain, and the subnet. Terraform is doing that on the fly with every, action, with every apply action to say what order do I need to create these items before I apply them to the infrastructure, so I'm guaranteed to have it work. Now finally, just to show you that I'm not completely full of it when, we get that, when I say we get that uh, destroy action for free, I'm in that, that 06 tenant configuration still. And let me go back here to all tenants. Come on. I'll let that load. Please don't make a liar out of me. So I'm in that 06 tenant. It's been created. I have it there. If I do a terraform destroy, it's going to refresh the state. And I hope I didn't lose network. I wonder if that's what happened. I'm still there. Yeah, I wonder if I lost network or VPN or something. Oh, no, no, it's still there, still there. Okay, perfect. Got excited for a second. So, it refreshed the state, reached out to the ACI fabric and said, okay, I have this state in my state file that's been shared. And you can see in the folders here, I have this uh, terraform.tf state. So that's my save state file that it created when I did the apply. It says, here's my state file. Here's what exists on the fabric. Let me make sure they're in sync before. And then once they are checked, it says, OK, I can delete them. I have the red minuses there. Are you sure you want to destroy? Type yes. And eventually, it'll rip all that out. And you just saw QMS tenant 06 disappear. 
So without having to rewrite anything, I get that reverse action for free. So with that, I'm at the, the, the 30 minute mark. I'm, I'll be around for questions. Um, anything about Terraform, like I said, if you join the, the, the space, uh, I am able to, I'll send you the sample code, uh, give you the, the repository of all the code that I've used as well as the presentation. Um, please complete your session sur surveys. They are important to us. It helps us get better, it helps me get better, um, and it helps me know your temperature on Terraform. And there's lots of other Terraform courses around in, in the DevNet zone as well as elsewhere, so please continue your education and thank you.